close to 70 years ago at UCLA, I saw this guy almost daily. He was the first alumni or alumnus to treat me as a brother. I uh, pledged Phi Psi uh, the year before Chuck did. And uh, when he came into the house, I thought he was a loud about asshole. <laughs> Some names here that you might recognize. Charles Lindbergh, Jimmy Doolittle, Roscoe Turner, Gordon Cooper, Tony Levere, Bob Hoover, and Chuck Swift. Where I, you know, me not knowing how to fly, he kept going on the intercom and going, we have to get lower, we have to get lower. Chuck loved a picnic. And I grabbed my briefcase and he opened the trunk and inside the trunk are 20 dogs. Where are we going? And this is typical Chuck. You'll know when we get there. We spent the last time with Chuck that he was conscious with us, and it was probably the most special time that I've spent with anybody. <laughs> he has made such an impact on me and my life. He was a people person. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank everyone from, for coming, for showing up and support my dad. I'd um, like to introduce my family first. My beautiful wife, Eleni, in the back. Any free psychiatric care you wish to um, provide will be greatly appreciated. Uh, my brother should be somewhere in here. Stand up, please. His wife, Kyoko, who's probably in the kitchen. Oh, here, stand up, please, Kyoko. My, my brother's son, Tag. My brother's daughter, Laurel, who's holding Stella. Her husband, Matt. Wrong, wrong daughter. Wrong daughter. My sister. My sister, Amy. Her husband, Don. And let's see, I have uh, my daughter, Sarah. Her, hus her husband, that's the Matt. And, and my grandson, George. And my daughter, Jessica, is somewhere in the house. And her, her fiance, Ken. That's, that's the, all I put in the will, so if there's anyone else, speak up now. Oh, my daughter, Jessica. Grace. Grace. My, my, my daughter name tag. And yes, Tori. Tori. Thank you for standing. And my sister-in-law, Stacy. My sister-in-law, Marilyn. My nephew, Noah somewhere around here. And I also want to thank um, Stacy's friend, Jill, for helping put this party on. Just to start off, if you have flown in 201 Whiskey Charlie, please stand.
Thank, thank you. So, Willie, would you like to start us off? And Willie, would you like to do that from down there so you don't have to step up here? You want to come up here? Okay. It's me. Hello. There you go. Hey. I'll hold it, Willie. I'll hold it. I'm, I guess I'm like the uh, warm-up show in the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, the warm-up were the Beatles to Frank Sinatra. So I hope this uh, is uh, satisfactory to everybody. Anyway, 70 years ago, this June, this guy graduated from high school, entered UCLA, and uh, joined my fraternity Phi Kappa Psi. I wrote a poem to celebrate the 70 years that I knew him as a friend and a brother. So here is to Charles Warren Swift, better known to everybody as Chuck. To write these words is my style. And this line is my way to say things about my brother that I want to say. And he said, composing a poem for my dad would be really terrific. But to celebrate his life, you have to be extra prolific. Although I at first objected and became somewhat evasive, I found that my wife, Mary Lou, can be very persuasive. <laughs> and to celebrate the life of Brother Swift took little persuasion. For me to put words and into prose for such a historic occasion. Close to 70 years ago at UCLA, I saw this guy almost daily. Where we became lifelong friends at 613 Gailey. We formed a band of brotherhood and an everlasting tie that kept us all the brothers together, thanks to Fly Campus Psi. At the Virginia Country Club, each December, this guy was no stranger. Chuck was both the greeter, the host, and the primary arranger. The Brotherhood gathered together with wine and goodies to munch on, followed by more wine and more singing and a fabulous luncheon. Flying down to Campbell San Lucas for that Super Bowl weekend, there was always one guy we all could depend. Whether on the ground or in the air, we never were that nervous. Our fate in the hands of the Chuck Swift Travel Service. And now, brothers, that the good Lord has taken you upstairs. No more canes, no more walkers, and no more wheelchairs. And someday we all join you to celebrate our love for you in the past, the true everlasting eternity that forever will last. So Chuck, from Westwood to Cabo, we had a really great time. And these great times in the past are the point of this rhyme. This poem is a celebration of your life not a time to shed tears. Thanks for being my brother and my friend for all of these years. So that's the end of our program. <laughs> but I think that uh, John Marshall had asked to speak, and uh, 
John? I love altitude. <clears throat> If you're a QB, please stand up. Holy cow. Wow. We love him too. My name is John Marshall. Most of you, uh, especially non-QBs, certainly don't know who I am. But I have some names here that you might recognize. Charles Lindbergh, Jimmy Doolittle. Roscoe Turner, Gordon Cooper, Tony LeVere, Bob Hoover, and Chuck Swift. Now, what do these guys have in common? Sure, they did fly airplanes, even the noisy ones. One was even an astronaut, but there's more, much more. They were all QBs, all those gentlemen. And if you don't fly, you probably don't know what QB stands for. QB is Quiet Birdman, the ancient and secret order of quiet bird men, as we like to say. It's been a tradition for a long time. The ancient and secret order has been around for more than nine decades. This nationwide fraternal group of aviators has been pretty quiet. And as I say, that's part of our tradition. No publicity, no press, no nothing except friendship. Now, just who are these guys? Well, they do. Uh, where are the wings? That's the big version down there. These, these pins are kind of hard to get, these uh, QB wing pins. But we also use a, a membership card like this. And one thing about it, nowhere is the word pilot on here. It doesn't say you're a good pilot, an accomplished pilot, or anything. But it does clearly say that the wearer, the bearer of this card is a good fellow, a good fellow, and that's what it's about. Flying just gets you in the door at our QB meetings as a guest or a future candidate. And by the way, to become a QB, it isn't easy. The candidacy, the initiation process are quite lengthy. Uh, and that's necessary because we got to find out whether the guy is a good fellow, and he's got to find out whether he fits or whether he even wants to come to our meetings. So it takes a long time. It does make it hard for some guys to get in. We do, we do screen our lawyer pilots uh, very carefully. <laughs> so when we gather for our monthly membership meetings, it's like being with 50 to 100 of your best friends, and I do not exaggerate. So the common bond among QBs is friendship, not just flying. Undoubtedly, Chuck was a very successful businessman. He was a, a good husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather three times over. But Charles Warren Swift was also a good, a good fellow and a very good friend, a dear friend of every member of the Los Angeles QB organization, and we will deeply miss him. Thank you. Thank you, John. I guess I'll give it to you. Thank you very much. I'm proud to take it. Would, would my brother like to come up here and say anything? You're the one that needed the help. Trying not to fall down. Thank you, thank you all for being here. Chuck, Chuck liked to remind me of this story. Around 1970, we made a trip to San Francisco. Somehow my high school girlfriend was there. We had reservations at the Blue Fox, the restaurant across the street from the morgue. That's how they build themselves. It was supposed to be one of the finest restaurants in the country. Can't hear you. I was I was dressed up. I had a paisley shirt with shiny fabric and a wide collar. 
I even had shoes on. When we got inside, we were told, the young gentleman must have coat and tie before we can see your group. We can loan him a tie, but we don't have a coat. Chuck asked, how long can you hold the reservation? An hour. When we got back outside, the valet hadn't moved the car. Chuck said he knew when he saw me what was going to happen next. The next stop was a phone booth with a phone book. Chuck found what he wanted, made a quick phone call, and came back to the car. He announced that we would get back to the restaurant in time. Where are we going? And this is typical Chuck. You'll know when we get there. It seemed like it took forever to get to the Salvation Army store. I got a coat and tie. We got back to the restaurant in time, and Chuck waited until dessert to show the maitre d' the receipt. Thank you, Steve. Um, we're also joined today by my father's and my Phi Kappa Psi brothers, and I should have asked the Phi Kappa Psi attending to stand. And at this time, I'd like to ask if anyone else would like to speak. Zach? Jonas? Come on up. Okay. You know, I uh, pledged five side uh, the year before Chuck did. And uh, when he came into the house, I thought he was a loud mouth asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he like, pretty much stayed that way. <laughs> but as the years wore on, there were some other qualities that came out with Chuck. And those qualities include his obsessive compulsion, his intelligence, his caring. He cared. He cared for the brothers that he pledged with. He cared for the fraternity and the brothers that were in it. And he kept us all alive. And for years and years, Chuck put together an annual luncheon that put us back together. He called people up. He went to visit people's houses. He kept rosters. He kept this chapter of UCLA Cap Cal California Club alive for the rest of us. And it, when Jerry opened his house uh, in Cabo San Lucas, he began to include brothers that he didn't even know. And those brothers now are 30 years younger and are beautiful brothers that we all have grown to love and honor. And thank you, Chuck, for keeping this fraternity alive. And Richard is a little closer to uh, my father's age than my own. Um, and I, but I'm not that close to Zach. <laughs> Zach, uh, what, you're uh, 10 years out of school? Yeah. And you, uh, you helped a lot uh, getting things done down in Cabo with my dad. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Thank you. Uh, uh, when I was first asked to say a few words, I didn't quite know what to say. Um, I met Chuck about six or seven years ago uh, when I was an intern down in Cabo. And the first interaction with him, he called me because uh, we were planning the Super Cabo Bowl. And he said, I need to get fireworks to Mexico. How can I do it? And I said, I don't know. Have you checked with TSA? He said, yeah, they told me I couldn't do it. <laughs> And so I said, uh, well, when we need to get things down to the compound, sometimes you just don't declare it, and you hope that you hit the green button. And he said, I'll try it. 
So he came down and he got the red button. And But he said, I talked to a local official, official and they said I didn't have to declare it. So somehow he got it through. I still don't know. <laughs> uh, but when I think of Chuck, there's uh, three words that come to mind. And one is humor, because um, he had a good sense of humor. Uh, sometimes got him in trouble, but always kept us on our heels. Um, the other one is fearlessness, because he would continue to do anything, no matter what uh, came in front of him. And the other one is passion, and especially his passion for family and Phi Kappa Psi. So thank you all for coming today. Thank you, thank you Jeff. Um, Hello. Okay, that's good. Thank you all for being here. Um, I couldn't not say anything about Chuck Swift. So I started at CW Swift. Uh, God, I don't want to tell you the year I'm going to age myself. I know, right? With Bernadette. That's when I started with Bernadette. No, way before. But, you know, after my father passed away, you know, Chuck became like my surrogate father. And he told me, he goes, don't worry. He goes, I got you. He goes, you hang with me and I'm gonna show you some, you know, good times. And that he did. Just a few antidotes about Chuck, you know, with the airplane. I had never been in a small plane before. And the first time we flew, we flew to Watkins Johnson in Palo Alto. And we jump in this little plane, and um, I even remember the little QB line here. Uh, this is Condors. Well, Condors. Yeah. Condors, excuse me. Right. And uh, white knuckles hanging onto that plane, but we made it to Palo Alto, had a wonderful visit, and we picked you up, I think, along the way. And we're flying back, and he goes, we're going to have lunch. And I said, okay, you know, we're going to go back to Van Nuys and have lunch. So, no. He makes this detour in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, where is he going? And he pulls over in this grass lot at Harris Ranch. It was, um, you know, it was for a little, you know, 20, 20 something. Never done this before. It was quite an experience. So we got out, we had steaks or whatever jump back on the plane and you know everybody his thing was look for planes so we're all sticking our heads out trying to make sure and we flew out got to Van Nuys and after that it was a breeze because Chuck and I would fly every year in December we would fly to uh, uh, Utah to visit L3 in Salt Lake City and it had to be December because that's when the uh, Tabernacle. Tabernacle Choir would be rehearsing. And Chuck loved to go and, and listen. The, and the rehearsals were free. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Chuck and I would fly in. He would go buy his, uh, his chocolates. He loved these mint chocolates. And he would buy cases of them to hand out to everybody. And we would go, and everybody at L3 just waited for him because he had the gifts. He had the chocolates, the pistachios. We would go out and have lunch, and we would check out the, uh, what was it, the uh, Goodwills all over Salt Lake. Anybody you know? need an 8-track player? Oh, he picked everything up. And we would fly back, and there was one occasion where I, you know, me not knowing how to fly, he kept going on the intercom and going, we have to get lower, we have to get lower. And I kept looking at him, I thought, okay, it's all good, it's all good. And then he'd go back and say, oh, there's still some ice on the wings, I think we have to get lower. Um, and I'm like, okay, should I panic? And then I looked at Chuck and he was cute, cool as a cucumber. And I said, okay, he's fine, you know. And I guess I didn't realize how dangerous ice on the wings are until, you know, we landed and I, kind of did some research on it. <laughs> but looking at Chuck, he was the coolest pilot. He would just kick back and fly the plane. No issues. So I'm going to miss Chuck because he was a wonderful human being. 
a wonderful, wonderful man. You know, I don't think there's going to be another Chuck, never. right? The ever. Never. He was, never. he was the best. And God bless you. I know he's here in spirit. He really is because he ordered the green tablecloths. I'm telling you. We ordered black. We they ordered showed black. up green. Yeah, and it was the perfect green. So I know he's here. So thank you all. Enjoy. Um, but before you finish. I forgot to introduce you, Mike. Oh. Andy, okay, you introduce her. Okay. I, um, I guess I'm probably not in that will either. Um, my mother-in-law, Penny. Yes. Penny Wade. 93. 93, 94 this August. And I should have thought of this earlier. Um, Anyone who's ever worked for C.W. Swift, please stand. Thanks for helping pay for this. Hi, guys. George. So, I'm Sarah. Chuck was my grandpa. Um, I'm just like my dad, I can't pass up an opportunity to be the center of attention, so I'm up here now. <laughs> Nobody asked me to be up here. Um, or I guess you did. So, um, I worked for CW Swift for about 10 good years until Dolly fired me. Uh, <laughs> um, and every day Chuck would call with questions for me. And as the millennial that I am, he thought that I knew the questions to the answers to all these questions. Number one, Sarah, what is a panini? <laughs> what is a hashtag? How do I message on Facebook this cute girl that I met at the bar? <laughs> and then I would tell Dolly, and she'd be like, oh, God, Chuck. <laughs> but, uh, I, well, I think it's unconfirmed, spent the last time with Chuck that he was conscious and with us, and it was probably the most special time that I've spent with anybody. <laughs> First of all, he told my baby to shut up. Uh, <laughs> he flirted with all the nurses. He told me a really long story about um, the Kentucky Derby that I still don't know why he told me. But, uh, the most important thing he said was, Sarah, I love you, and you should hug people more. <laughs> um, he was a really cool guy, and I'm just so lucky to see that he had such a you know, big effect on so many people, and it's really cool to see, because, I mean, I don't know a lot of you guys. Um, you probably know me, because I'm a really cute baby. So you're like, oh, that was a cute baby, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's so cool to see, and I just want to thank all of you for being here to honor my really cool grandpa. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Here. Anyone else like to say a word? John? Come on up. I'm Dick Snyder. I share a few things with Chuck. We were both chairs of a um, international microwave symposium. One of my fondest and, and most memorable artifacts that I have on the wall of my office is a, is a uh, clock that Chuck sent me in time for 2003 when I was the general chair. It says, time is passing, time is running out. I keep that clock running, I keep the batteries going. It's, it's a memory of Chuck. I have so many little gimmicks and toys. You know, I'm wearing one right now actually, you know, little thing that um, Chuck gave out. But what I miss most, and I will miss most, is the calls that I received from him pretty often in the last few years. And he would always start out by saying, hi, this is the handsome one, you know? And uh, that was Chuck. And we'd, you know, have a conversation about gimmicks that we could give out at the next IMS, you know? He, he kind of thought that I was in charge of the IMS like forever, you know, and, instead of just one time. But hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I heard one of his fraternity brothers say 
you know, he had qualities, I think it was Zach, he had, you know, qualities of intelligence and, and caring and friendliness. And these are the things that anybody that's ever been around Chuck will never forget. He was a people person. You know, I don't know if he knew how to message things as his granddaughter said. I don't know any of that, but, uh, well, you know, he, he, he probably figured it out. You know, we would have a conversation, I mean, in person sometime, you know, when we were at a meeting or, or uh, again, you know, over the phone very frequently. In fact, as frequently, as recently as two weeks before he passed away, you know, we'd call up and say, yeah, this really sucks, you know, I, I mean, I you know, can't get up, you know, I get 24-hour care, you know. And we'd kid around a little bit, and I'd tell him a joke, he'd tell me a joke, and at the end of the day, he was laughing. He, he was a guy that always made me feel good. And so that's my memory of Chuck that I just wanted to share with everyone, and I will miss him greatly. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck was one of these uh, local uh, chapter meetings which he provided uh, uh, refreshment. Well, anyway, he said, Oh, I'm asking you. Oh, he's speaking the mic. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can all sing, I hate to hear Japanese speakers. <laughs> public speaking, but I do have to say, I worked for CW Swift from 1990 to 2006. This has been a great family to me, and the one thing that I shared with Chuck was the fact that his birthday was on March 2nd, my birthday was on March 1st, and every single year since 1990, we have shared our birthdays together with going out to lunch with me and him, him and Helen. And even 12, 13 years later, I still feel very close to this family. And I'm very sad that he's gone, but he has made such an impact on me in my life that I'll never forget him. And the funny thing is, at, at one point, we had somebody whose birthday was on the first, the second, the third, and there was a salesman who worked with us for many years, and his birthday was on the 5th. And we would celebrate that week, and I will never forget it for the rest of my life. Just a little uh, Chuck anecdote. We would get all of the microwave wraps together for a dog to every year. And you know his uh, propensity for a gag. He would come with a lifetime supply of balls. So, uh, they get lost on the field. So he would blow these things up. Balloons. Well, well no. Beach balls. Beach balls. Beach balls. Beach balls. Beach balls. Thank you. And so he would blow these things up and cast them out. Okay. We're the only group of people that were ever 86 from the Dodgers Stadium. Oh <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, the way I remember it, um, because I worked as an usher at Dodger Stadium, and um, beach balls were just the bane of an usher's life because the management expected you to get that ball. So you were running from one place to another, and uh, yeah, I really thought it was cool of my father to break the rules. I don't think he ever paid any attention to the rules. Um, Bob and Mary's going to come up, but while he's walking up here, um, I'll explain that I am also a Phi Kappa Psi at Cal Epsilon, and I pledged at the age of 60, after driving my father to the um, fraternity house, for two or three years, um, my father learned that uh, a young man at 50 had pledged Phi Kappa Psi at USC, and he started to work um, with the hierarchy at uh, um, the foundation and uh, 
the summer of 2017, I took um, Western Civilization at UCLA and pledged my father's fraternity in October of 2017. And now I have his brothers as my brothers. Hey. I failed it. <laughs> well, Chuck was a great friend of mine. We were competitors uh, in the sales of RF microwave components. And during the 70s, when there was a gasoline strike, Chuck called me and said, you know, I know you want to go up to Raytheon Goleta, and I need to go up too, so let's carpool. So we did. So he picked me up and uh, threw my briefcase in the back of his little Mercedes in the back behind the seat. And we drove up there and we got out of the car. And I grabbed my briefcase and he opened the trunk. And inside the trunk are 20 dogs. Now these are dogs. You know, they're about 8, 10, a foot high. And I said, well, you got to be kidding me. What are we going to do? He said, I'm going to sell dogs. So we, so we went into the lobby, lobby one, and um, he called one of the engineers. So one of the engineers comes out and, and Chuck puts the dog down and he says, watch this. Well, Chuck, clap, clap. The dog re goes back and he starts barking. Well, I mean, this was great. And this, this engineer said, fantastic, how much are they? He said, 15 bucks. So, okay, great. P pulls out 15 bucks, gives them to Chuck, grabs the dog. dog. Chuck says, wait, wait, give me the dog back. You don't, you know, you didn't pay for the batteries, so. <laughs> He, and he did it with a straight face. He took the batteries out, put them bound, gave him the, gave him the, um, gave him the dog, and at the end of the day, he sold 20 dogs. I sold nothing. <laughs> Anyone else? Scott Spencer. I've known Chuck for many years. Uh, he used to visit me at Great Young and I can tell you one thing. Chuck loved a picnic. Okay. Uh, he used to come up and set up in Stowe Park and invite everybody. And uh, it's just a wonderful thing. And then later on, we traveled all through Europe and we always had to have a picnic. And I think Andy and Helen will remember the time we pulled into a field in Italy. We had all the cold cuts spread out in the back of the hatchback, and we sat on our water bags and had a picnic. And I was very happy. But I'll give you one anecdote that relates to piloting. I was up in San Jose, and the motorcycle races were at uh, Laguna Seca that weekend. So I called Chuck, and he said, sure, I'll fly up to Salinas if you can meet me. So I did. We went to Laguna Seca. There was an inversion layer. Um, and uh, Chuck kept looking up at the sky and said, Steve, what do you think, VFR? Steve was going, no, I have bar. Kept saying it, kept saying it. Finally, the clouds lifted. He said, what do you think, Steve? VFR? And he says, you VFR. He goes, Andy, get me a beer. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for that was you had to have an IFR ticket to fly through the clouds. Yes. And neither my brother or I ever achieved having an IFR ticket. Now, when we picked up the plane on December 22nd, 1969, we had a little mishap leaving Beechcraft in Wichita, Kansas. The front door popped open once we got to altitude. We landed, closed the door, but as soon as we were off the ground again, it popped open. So we flew back to Wichita um, for warranty work. And so we were several hours later than we thought we would be. And on the way to Albuquerque, it was socked in and Jerry Dockery and my father just headed through it. Never telling my mom, we're not licensed to prove to do this. But he, it, once again, he was fearless. Anyone else? Charlie? Uh, two quick things. Um, um, Chuck was chair of the microwave symposium, and I think JK and I were both inspired by him. It's clear that uh, Chuck inspired other communities. Uh, if anyone has an interest, um, if you Google YouTube, one penny opera. I, I have it here. Okay. We'll, we'll be playing it shortly. Thank you.
symposium, and I think they were trying to get their own little homage. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Anyone else, or is it time to yell? Chris? And uh, if you stand on this side, the mic reads better. This side? Yeah, because there's... Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Lewis. I'm the Director of Public Relations for Sequoia Innovation. Um, I, the first time I met Brother Chuck Swift, uh, I was a pledge for Phi Kappa Psi. Brother Swift did not know I was a pledge at the time, but he was the first alumni or alumnus to treat me as a brother. And uh, one of the defining reasons I went on to join Phi Kappa Psi. Chuck and I initially bonded over red hair, but it quickly became a relationship full of laughs, friendship, practical advice, uh, wisdom, pranks, and jokes, and ultimately an introduction to Andy, uh, one of my big brothers. Uh, I'm so fortunate to have been part of Chuck's loving family, and Phi Psi will never forget him. Live ever, die never. Thank you, Phil. We should sing. Yeah. So all the brothers up here for the by side. Hearts from them shall never be broken. For the old by side. Far surpassing wealth unspoken. Still by friendship's side. Turn it on. Anyone else? Chris? Yeah. One, two, one. Does still work. Okay, one, okay, wonderful. So, so let's see the back seat. Chris, Chris, right, right. Steve, Steve, Laura, and Larry. Where's Larry? And Larry. Okay, so if you guys would come over on the other side of the tent, we'll do a quick briefing and then we'll get the show on the road. Thanks, everyone. And just one more thing. We've broken off, and so the red line, and uh, do not go past the yellow rope. Once we get back and land and get the planes pushed back, you guys are more than welcome to come and visit the airplanes. But while we're moving, just everyone, please stay on this section here, okay? All right, have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. And just one last um, thing. Jess, uh, where are you, Jess? Um, Jess is given airplane rides, and so if you would like to go for a ride with Jess, please come and speak to me. And uh, back to the bar. <laughs>